All right. I know it's cold outside, but you need to go ahead and put your game faces on because it's time to worship. And it's time for church. Welcome, First Street. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. Come on, yeah. The everlasting God. You do not think you won't go weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Woo! Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. up on wings like eagles who was and who is and who is to come you are who was and who is and who is to come who was and who You won't go weary in the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. All right, stay stand up, stay stand up. Welcome about 5, 10, 15 people. Give them a good warm welcome. Have a good, let's do it. Jump in. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs>
Good morning, good morning. We are glad you're here this morning. Welcome to First Street Church. We got a good morning plan for y'all. <clears throat> so, so this morning what we've kind of tried to do is kind of strip away all the tradition, all the stuff that kind of gets in the way. And uh, we want to kind of get you all connected this morning. So go ahead, find your spot. I want you to think about something for a second as we get ready to worship this morning. It's all right. It's all right. So... This morning, we're going to try to try to strip away some of the stuff that we get used to. So we got Adam doing some music this morning. But I want you guys to think about something. I want you to think about something before we get into the music this morning. Do you realize that when we come together on Sunday morning, it's, it's not about a band. It's really not about the music. It's not even about the message or the pastor. Really, why we come together on Sunday morning is to worship God. And sometimes the things that get in the way of that could be our busyness or could be our lives, but oftentimes on Sunday mornings it could be, well, I don't like the music or the preacher's too bald or something like that gets in our way, right? So this morning we just want to strip everything away and we want you to think about this. You are singing, listen, you are singing to the God of the universe. And when your voice is worshiping him and when your heart is focused on him he smiles he's that's what he's created us for and so just you know maybe the songs are a little different maybe not having a full band up here is kind of different maybe maybe when we're reading the scripture or we're talking through god's words something's different and it's catching your attention strip that all away that's all tradition you're worshiping the God of the universe this morning. Let's do that together. Be the king of my heart. Be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from. Ooh, he is my song. Yeah. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, who oh, is my song. And you are good, you're good. Ooh, you are good, you're good. Ooh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails. The anchor in the waves, who oh, is my song? Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, who oh, is my song? And you are good, you're good, who oh, you are good. You're good. Ooh, ooh. You are good. You're good. Ooh, ooh. You are good. You're good. Ooh, ooh. And as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and you shall we? Sorry, crown, good Lord, show me the way. Yeah. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down. Don't you want to go down? Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. And as I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way. 
do shall wear the robe and crown. Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down. Come on down. Don't you want to go down? Oh, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear sorry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. Oh. Sinners, let's go down. Come on down. Don't you want to go down? Oh, sinners, let's go down. Down in the river to pray. Yeah. This morning, uh, this morning for, you know, for me and, um, you know, for, it, this is about worship. This is about bringing everything back and just getting down to what it is, what it is to worship. And um, this song, for me, it's like, I feel like I'm worshiping every time I just hear this song. You know what I mean? It's just one of those where you're just kind of, it's almost just a passive thing, just like a natural thing. Um, this, this song just kind of does all the work for you. And um, I don't know, I just love it. And uh, yeah, that's enough blabbering. God of creation, there at the start for the beginning of time. No point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born and The vapor of your breath The planets form if the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. of your promise you don't speak in vain a syllable empty oh for once you have spoken all nature and science follow the sound of your voice yeah. and as you speak hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you said if it all reveals 
Cause your nature is so alive Oh, I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, canvas of your grace If creation still obeys you so down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak hundred billion failures disappear Lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so alive yeah. I can see your heart and everything you've done Worship Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. Oh, I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. For worshiping. Every week we take communion to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, all of us. We come to the table to remember. The word remembrance means much more than recalling something or someone from the past. To remember is to make vivid, to make real, to recall. And in this case, it is remembering. It is the remembering of Jesus' words, his life, his deeds, and his death that brings life to us. Because of Jesus, we are redeemed. The Lord's Supper commemorates that fact. He wants us at, a, at his table each and every week. And last Saturday, our youth group went out to uh, Camp Agape out at Talon Point. And uh, this is a group, or this is a camp for special needs kids, um, particularly teenagers and adults. And uh, 
we were out there afternoon, evening. We got to serve dinner. Um, we hung out with them. The kids played with them, and then we went to the dance with them. And so over the course of the few hours that we were there, I met Casey. And Casey, and I met him several times, like four or five times that night. And every time that he introduced himself to me, he always talked about his table. And he talked about that his table had the best food, and he wanted everybody to sit at his table because it was at the best place in the whole building, and he could see out, um, he could see the trees, and he could see all of this. And he invited us to sit at his table. His table was fabulous. It was the best. Um, and he wanted everyone to experience it, to experience that for themselves. And God's love is like that with us. He wants us to live our best life with him every step of the way. Casey gets it, and we should too. Please pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today to thank you for your sacrifice. We knew, you knew what would happen, and you came anyway. And we're so grateful to be your people sitting at your table. We're so blessed to live in a community that not only allows, but welcomes you in all of your glory. Thank you for bringing us again together this week. We honor and worship you. We ask that your spirit fill this place, continue to protect us all, and that we see your blessings in all that we do each day. Thank you for loving us and calling us your own. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On Thursday, I attended a funeral of one of my former students. And at this funeral, I didn't understand one single word. It was in Spanish. And I took French in high school. Like, anyway. Um, but I didn't need to, and I didn't need to know what was said. Because I could see on everybody's faces that sat all around me and the family exactly um, the huge impact that Diana had on all of those around her. Um, at the very end of the service, her mother so bravely got up and addressed the crowd. And later on, I asked one of my students, what did she say? And this is what she said. Uh, Thank you for being in her life. Thank you for loving her. Thank you for supporting her. Cherish her life, the memories you have of her, and let that carry you to be better each day. God bless you all. So when coming to the table, we remember the sentences that embody life, the overwhelming sacrifice, and our response of gratitude. Some things we need not forget. Students lost, loved ones gone, and especially Jesus. Our sin nailed him to the cross, but his blood that he shed for us is a symbol that life, our life, is in the blood. As we take the cup today, remember who he is, 
who we are and whose we are and whose we are. Please pray with me. Lord, we love you and we thank you for giving us life, giving us the Bible and for your grace, love and mercy. We remember why you did what was needed and we are so grateful. Help us to be more like you, to show others who you are through our actions in our daily life. Please continue to bless us and our church family. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for always welcoming us with open arms to your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. this is the time when we can give back because God gave us everything he asked that we give back because it's all his anyways now is the time when you can support the ministries of our church keeping the lights on blessing others uh, we see the good that comes from these offerings our new pastor and his family the many successes of the refuge that we support and the AC is getting fixed so please give with your heart and pray with me Lord, we come to offer all that we have to honor you. Please continue to grow and strengthen our church family. Help us to share the message of you to everyone around us. Thank you again for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So while the offering's going around, just some uh, quick announcements to kind of get you guys all up to speed with what's happening around here. If you look in your bulletin, you can see a lot of the things in there. Each week we, we uh, try to give you the big information you need to know, but there's sometimes some things in the bulletin that we might miss, and so take a look at that. Also, we send off a, a newsletter every Wednesday. If you haven't got connected with that, send us an email here. Talk to Roro, and we'll get you on the list 
Uh, we also send off prayer requests on, on Mondays, and so we got a prayer newsletter. So if you have somebody that needs to be prayed for or a praise that you want to share that we've been praying for, let us know that, and we'll get that in there. If you're, this is your first time on the side of the bulletin, there's a little tear-out section. You can tear that off, fill that out, and uh, either throw it in the offering plate when it came by just a second ago, or you can take it to uh, the Welcome Center, and we will, we'd will we love to connect with you. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, Wendy and Adam, if you guys are actually taking a shower at some point, that's great. Uh, they have a baby shower this afternoon at 2, so uh, you're invited to be part of that. Also, Paul's Journey is here tonight, so you want to come to that. That'll be kind of a fun thing at 6 o'clock. Fall Festival this Wednesday. Uh, kids, if you want to come dressed up, you can. It's a fun time for our kids to hang out and have fun together. The big thing on that, too, is not just our kids having fun, but we have our high schoolers and middle schoolers that help serve in that. And it's a really unique opportunity for them, to, these kids, to interact and to build some some mentoring relationships and some positive relationships and so it's a great way for the older kids to serve and the younger kids to connect um, also if you are planning on going to israel you're going to get a card in the mail this week you need to get that to tk before the end of the week there's some important information he needs from you otherwise he's going to bombard you with phone calls every night at, like a telemarketer um, and then last of all uh, tomorrow i believe tomorrow night there's a special uh uh, event for the coach from um, Dumas High School that, that we've been praying for that's on our prayer list. Uh, just kind of a benefit opportunity, and so if you want to participate in that, check with Vanessa or Linda, and they can get you the details on that kind of stuff. So uh, It's time for Noisy Offering. So kiddos, you guys ready? Noisy Offering is a fun opportunity for the kids to participate in the service. So go for it. Let's go. Awesome. Let's pray. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, it's, it's a good morning that we get to come and worship you in, in a building. We get to come and focus our attention on you, not just in our singing, not just in our giving, but also in our listening. God, I pray that as, you, as your spirit prepares our hearts for what your word is going to share with us, God, over this next song, will you just remind us of how much you love us? Will you remind us, remind our hearts of, of what you want to do with us, that you want us to change, you want us to become more like your son? God, thank you that we have had an opportunity to worship you with our voices. We just continue to worship you through the rest of the morning. In your name, amen. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. Chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. I could have want more. Receive nothing but goodness. Tested and tasted your grace. Well, I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, 
God say, I'm undone by the mercy, Jesus, I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord, I'm restored and made right, He's got a hold of my life, I've got Jesus, I could have won more, the love of God. The love of God calls me up higher. His will is stronger. That's why I got saved. Now I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I love that harmony. I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus, I could have one more, yeah. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. Worship, I'm restored and made right. He's got a hold in my life. I've got Jesus, I could have one more. I've got Jesus, I could have one more. Adam, great job. Hey, it is, it's been a good morning, and uh, we're going to continue on. We're going to read a passage from Mark, Mark chapter 7. You ready? Wait, wait. Jesus teaches purity. You want to say something? All right, I'll just do that. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand-washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient, ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honor your father and, father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give God what I, what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is the only one example, and this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come in here. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes out of your heart, comes from your heart. Yeah, thank you. God, this morning we pray that you would help us to understand your word. Uh, some things can be kind of confusing. Some things when we read can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, some things cannot make sense. So God, anything that is in this passage as we look at it this morning that confuses us, anything in here that uh, challenges us, God, will you, will you use those um, misunderstandings or confusion and even sometimes those challenges, will you use those to change us? In your name, amen. When uh, Lori and I first got married, we had, um, we had some traditions that we came into family together with. Um, we had different traditions about Thanksgiving. We had different traditions about, uh, you know, birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, Lori and I, kind of one of, the, one of the things that has kind of maybe kept our marriage as close as it, as it is, is we don't really celebrate anniversaries. In fact, there's a couple times we've both forgotten our anniversary. Um, not, not that that's a big thing, but that we just didn't have huge value in those things. We had different values in, in what different celebrations and different traditions looked like. But there was one tradition that we both had that was very different, and it had to do with Christmas. Uh, my dad was a pastor, and every Christmas Eve we had a Christmas Eve service. And so our tradition in my family was that we would 
we would get to open presents after the Christmas Eve service. That was my tradition. So every Christmas Eve, I got to open presents. Well, as we started having kids, I found out that Lori's tradition was a little bit different. They only open presents on Christmas morning. And so not that it created a b- big conflict, but as we had kids and as our kids are growing up and, and celebrating Christmas, we had to wrestle with traditions that we both had some value in, that we had some memories in. And then it happened that our girls got into about middle school, and we decided, in fact, Rachel was hitting around middle school, and we decided to kind of change all of tradition. Um, We did something very strange. We let the girls open their presents on the first day of Christmas break. So like six days before Christmas, and you're thinking, well, that's just not right. You can't do that. That's not okay. Well, let me tell you what we did. So the, f- the first reason was we bought the girls a Nintendo Wii, you know, the little game thing, and we thought this is something we can do as a family, and it's Christmas break. It'll give them something to do when they're bored, and so we were kind of thinking ahead, like, well, let's just let them open up all their presents. Well, there's a- also another, another kind of cool thing. Do you know that the return lines before Christmas are much more manageable than the ones after? <laughs> We thought we were brilliant. It was awesome. Because you could walk in, you're like, there's no line. We want to return this. Awesome. Go get what you need. Come right back here. We were in and out of stores. What happened is, then we got to Christmas Day, and it was just like, I mean, we did, we did these stockings, and we put stuff in the stockings, so there's still something for the girls to open. But for the most part, it was, it was kind of a relaxed morning. In fact, we got up in the morning, and we had pancakes, and then we went to a movie, first movie in the morning, There was no one at the movie theater. I mean, we were the only ones. uh, There was other people there, but it was so few people. When we walk out of the movie, there's lines of people waiting to get into the movie. And we're like, man, this is the best day ever. And so in the middle of that, we kind of created a tradition. We we go to a movie every Christmas. Uh, That kind of became our tradition. Well, a few years after that, we decided to change it up again. We got up early, early Christmas Eve morning around 3 o'clock, got the girls up, threw them in the car without telling where we're going, and just started driving. Now, at first, we thought this was a good idea. But about a half hour into the complaining and the frustration from the girls that were woke up for no good reason, uh, we were kind of second-guessing ourselves a little bit. But we ended up going, we drove about two hours, two and a half hours outside of our uh, Sacramento. And we went to a wild animal park, and the goal, the the what we were doing is we were going to this place to stay overnight in these bungalows as a family. And, you know, the girls are worried about Christmas. What about our Christmas presents? What about this? Well, we had some of them with us. They didn't know all this stuff. We get there, and Abby, her favorite animal is an elephant, was an elephant. And so she got the opportunity, her Christmas present was the opportunity to uh, interact and wash an elephant. And we, we had these two bungalows that were right above the elephant enclosure. And so all night we got to hear the elephants and other animals. <laughs> um, but it was a fun, I- unique moment. And see, that's w- when we talk about traditions, traditions are these things that, that we love and that we, we are drawn to because they have memories, they have things behind them. And even though, even though we had a couple of these traditions and we kind of pushed back on them, we have these huge memories of growing up together as a family and, and interacting together. And I think we're going to be looking at a passage this morning, uh, and, and here's the idea. We all have these traditions that we hold on to. And, and the reality is most of the traditions that we have are more of preferences than they are like priorities in our lives, right? That they're these things that we hold on to because we have memories behind them, because we have these experiences. We have these, these things that we have, in, that we have gone through that we remember. And sometimes what can happen with tradition if you've ever had these moments when somebody tries to push against your traditions, there's this feeling in your gut like one of the Ten Commandments is being broken, right? Where you just feel like there's something wrong with the entire world. For instance, when you walked in this morning and then you found out there wasn't a band, one of the traditions of being at church is that there's a band and there's a group of people up here leading music. And then all of a sudden it's just Adam and what's going on? And for some people that could be such a wreck in their gut that it makes it very difficult to worship God. Or maybe, maybe you have other traditions that, that are these moments where you just feel like you, you've got to do them. Well, this morning we're not necessarily talking about traditions, uh, but, we're, but we do want to kind of think about the traditions that we have. I've grown up in some churches. Uh, I grew up in a church that if you didn't wear a suit and tie or a dress to church, uh, you really weren't allowed to come into the church service. 
uh, which really made it weird when I walked in with a dress once. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I never did that. But no, but, but you know, so the style of dress was a tradition in that church, and if you didn't wear a, cer- if a certain thing, you, you weren't accepted. You were kind of, you felt out of place. Um, I've been in churches where, uh, this is a big one, I remember growing up in the church, my dad was a pastor of a church, and hymn books were a big deal. Like, you, you only use a hymn book. And he, of all the nerve, decided on Sunday nights to use an overhead projector. Oh, of all the evils. And, and yet, I, I get it, but, but the idea of the hymnal was just, it was, it was how technology worked back then. There wasn't the ability to put it up on a screen. And so to, to know the words, it was about opening a book that had the words in it, so you knew what the words were. But then to put him on a screen, it was, it, he, I remember him coming home talking about the leader, some of the leadership in that church were so upset because he was using an overhead projector on Sunday nights. And, and this hymnal had become, like, huge important. I've been in churches where these kind of things get in the way of what the service is supposed to be. I remember one time, early off in my, in my ministry, where I got reprimanded for not doing the long prayer during the offering. Uh, apparently, a, a two-minute prayer was not long enough. And somebody came up to me and just was like, you, you, I don't think you should ever do that again. Do you know that that was supposed to be the long prayer? And I'm sitting there going, what is the long prayer? And why do I have to do a long prayer? What does that mean? And, and I, I, I feel like sometimes the things that get in the way of us worshiping God or recognizing God working in our lives are sometimes these things that we have value in. And again, I, I, just thinking, I wonder how many churches, how many relationships have been broken simply because somebody had an idea of a tradition that got in the way of God working and God moving. Well, today we're not talking about tradition But in the passage we're going to look at, Jesus is talking to a group of people who have some traditions, and the traditions have gotten in the way of worshiping God, of recognizing who God is and what he's doing. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 7. We're going to be in Mark chapter 7. Or if you have your little uh, journals, you can open up there. I'm going to encourage you this morning, as we're reading through this, if you catch something that grabs your attention as we're reading it, as we're going through the passage, circle it, highlight it. Uh, If you have those little journals, you can even use that to kind of write some notes there. Follow along with us because I want to walk through this passage that sometimes gets a little confusing for us. um, That can sometimes be a little bit of an awkward conversation when we talk about tradition. And hopefully what we'll see is that Mark is trying to get us to understand something about Jesus. Okay, so just quick recap. We've gone through the first six chapters of Mark. And in the first six chapters of Mark... Even go, get, starting to get into chapter 7, he is talking about who Jesus is. And then he's going to make this uh, kind of subtle shift in what he's talking about from who Jesus is to why does it matter that he is the Messiah? Why does it matter that he came? And then, and that's going to be kind of more in chapters 8 through 10. And then back of 10 through the end of the book of Mark, he's going to shift into more of, well, why did Jesus come? What was his purpose? And so here he makes kind of a subtle shift in talking about why Jesus came. But in the first six chapters, we've seen that Jesus is, he's a healer. He's a rebel. He's a teacher. We've seen that he's a deliverer and he's a savior. So we've seen these, these, these things about Jesus from Mark. Now he makes a little bit of a shift. And he starts moving into, well, why did Jesus come? That's where we're going to get to here in chapter 7. And he kind of... He kind of depicts this this challenge between Jesus and the religious elite. And this is one of these moments that is a huge marker. Uh, According to scholars, Jesus is probably about into the middle of his second year at this point of ministry. And so it's kind of getting towards the end of this ministry time. And these religious leaders are trying to find a way to to kind of ruin the momentum of Jesus and who Jesus is because he's pushing back on some stuff. So let's go along with this, starting in verse 1. We're going to read this together, a look at this together. Uh, follow with me. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come to, from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding on to the tradition of the elders. And when they had come from the marketplace, 
they do not eat unless they wash, and there are many traditions like that that they observe, such as washing the cups and washing pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Now, just so you kind of know, in the, it, there's, there's the, the religious law, there's the, the, the law that God gave out, but then there was a supplementary kind of thing that the, the religious elite had put together called the Mishnah. The Mishnah was just basically oral traditions that they had passed down that they thought were incredibly valuable. Uh, th- they had this idea, this thought, that tradition, that if they could create some traditions, those could be a fence around the law. In, in essence, they would create these, these laws or these rules to try to protect people from unintentionally breaking the law of God. So the whole idea of washing hands and washing stuff was more of what the priests had to do, but they didn't want people to be defiled, and so they created more laws to try to keep people from breaking the law of God, all right? And so they would do this, and, 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 and ideally, at, at first, it was probably a good idea. It was probably a, a, a smart thing to kind of do. Uh, if you don't want somebody to break a law, well, kind of back the law up a little bit and, and create some other laws to keep them from breaking the law, right? The problem was, by the time it became around the time of Jesus, these laws had become so ridiculous, so absurd, there were so many of them, that it was impossible to follow them, and in the Jewish mindset, those laws were actually more important than God's word itself. For instance, God's law is that we need to keep, the, that the, the Jews had to keep the law, uh, keep the Sabbath day holy, Right? And so the idea of that is that on the Sabbath, you shouldn't be doing a whole lot of work. You shouldn't be overly exerting yourself. You need to make that a day of rest that you focus on who God is. Well, they had made a law that you couldn't even look in a mirror on the Sabbath. Because if you looked in the mirror and you saw gray hair and you go to pull that hair, you are doing work. Yeah, kind of extreme, right? Uh, they, they had created these other laws where if, um, if, if you if you had like a piece of cloth that you need to carry with you, like from upstairs to downstairs, you need to go cl- wipe something up or whatever. Well, you couldn't wipe it up, first of all. But, but also, if, if you wanted to carry anything with you, you had to wear it. So if you had like a handkerchief type of thing, you'd put it on and you could walk around with that all day and you could take it off and use it for whatever you need to blow your nose or whatever. But, but you could not carry it in your hand because that was work. I, I mean, just absurd rules and laws that they were expecting people to follow all because they were trying to keep the Sabbath day holy. If you spit on the dirt, you couldn't rub it out with your sandal. That was work. They had laws about cleanliness. Now, cleanliness is, is a good thing. We, we need to be clean. We need to make sure our hands are washed and all that kind of stuff. The problem was a lot of the laws that they came up with were mostly for the priests, and then they just exaggerated them even more so to the people that were Jews. They would, uh, they would wash things in a certain way. It wasn't just about washing your hands, but you had to wash them a certain way. You'd take water, and you'd pour it down. You'd have it poured down your hands, and you'd let it run down to your elbows. And then you'd say some type of prayer or something. And then you'd put your hands down this way, and they'd wash it down this way. And then you had to hold your hands up until they dried, and you couldn't touch anything. And it was just, and, and you had to do that every single time you were going to, before you ate something, before you touched anything that could be eaten. Now, those were, those were ceremonial things that the, that the priests had to do, but they had in, instituted it with everybody had to do that. They had gotten so ridiculous that, God, that Jesus is starting to kind of push back. In fact, the Mishnah has 35 pages dedicated to how to wash dishes. 35 pages. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And so they've got all these laws, all these traditions, and and they had become so specific and so narrowed down that the concept of impurity was no longer uh, was no longer grasped because they were so worried about the outer purity of people. They were so worried about how people perceive them on the outside that they had forgotten what uh, what these laws, what these what these guidelines were really put in place by God. And so they have all these rules and all these regulations. Right? Keep. Let's keep going. Verse five. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
In vain they do not worship me, teaching as, as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the traditions of men. These religious elite, they, they were looking for an opportunity to nail, pun intended, Jesus. They were, they were looking for an opportunity to pin him on something. And so all of a sudden they notice that his disciples are not washing their hands before they eat. Now it was never a law of God to do that for the Jew, only for the priests. But these religious leaders are looking at it going, well, you know, the law says that you're supposed to wash your hands. Why aren't your disciples doing that? And Jesus responds in a way that is, that is perfect. And, and in this culture, it's a normal way to react to things. Instead of fighting back on them, he does, remember a few weeks ago, we talked about remezes. Jesus goes back to Isaiah chapter 29, and he quotes it. And basically, in this passage, God is calling out the religious leaders of Israel. So in a, um, a remez was a quote of scripture, and the, and the people that were hearing the remez would have to remember the verses before and the verses after to understand what, what the individual was saying to them. And so when he quotes the scripture about their hearts being far from God, he, he, God was talking to religious leaders of Judah who had gotten things so twisted and so distorted that they were forgetting about who God was. And so Jesus is, is calling these guys out. He's telling them. He's, he's basically saying the same thing God said, that these people have twisted and distorted God's truth so much that God is going to judge them. Jesus is calling them hypocrites. He's calling them publicly. And in, in, in this culture, especially in Jewish tradition, if a person was a hypocrite, they were held to a judgment from God. They were, they were expected to feel the wrath of God, not the grace of God. And so here's Jesus. He's calling them hypocrites publicly. Look at verse 9. He said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Okay, kids, this is a scary one. Back in, in, in the Old Testament tradition, if you said something negative about your parents, you could be taken out and put to death. That'd be pretty cruel, right? It'd be like, oh, man, I'm, I would even live to be five, <laughs> right? So, so that was the law. That was the law that God had established because he wanted people to honor their fathers and mothers. But the religious leaders had changed it. They had changed the law. They started to do that. They started, they changed it to where if I dedicate anything to God, I don't have to give it to my parents. And so the workaround of, of taking care of your parents as they got older in age when they couldn't provide for themselves, the workaround was to say, well, you know, I've given everything to God and it's his, so I can't really give it to you. They had, if you were in a moment of anger between you and your parents and you said, you said, I give everything to God and not to you. If you just said it in a moment of anger, you still had to keep that vow to God and you did not have to give your parents anything. They had twisted scripture around so that they could benefit. That's what Jesus is calling out. They worship God on the outside, but they hadn't been transformed or changed on the inside. And so they've twisted the truth into self-centeredness instead of being God-centered. Here's the thing. Jesus isn't saying that these traditions are evil. He's not pushing back on the traditions. But he's saying that the practice of them um, was not what it was intended to be. In fact, many traditions are worship-filled. We, we do baptism, and we do communion, and, and all those things are great. That We have Christmas celebrations. All these things are really good. But there are times when our traditions can get in the way of it. You know, communion is one of those traditions that I love. It's a huge, it's an amazing picture. And, and Vanessa did a good job of showing us and reminding us of the picture of what it means to have communion with God. But if, if, if communion is always after the fourth song, and then we have to have Sister Mab Mabel come up and sing that Amazing Grace song that she always sings every time for it to really be a heartfelt communion moment I, I think we've missed it do you know that Jesus in fact it was in the middle of tradition that Jesus instituted communion it, it wasn't it was it, there was a tradition traditional meal that they would have and some of you have practiced this in the past 
you've, you've gone through this in the past, but there's a meal that they would have. And during the meal, there's these two moments when Jesus just kind of stops everything. It was normal for the, for the leader of the, the meal to break bread and to pl- pray a blessing. It was normal for a leader to pray a blessing over the cup. But in the middle of this tradition, Jesus says, all of these traditions that you've been practicing with communion, all of, or, or all these uh, with, the, with the Passover, I'm going to institute a new one. Do you know that all these traditions, this tradition that you've been practicing year after year, has been talking about me coming to earth, and I'm going to die on the cross, and I'm going to break, my, my body's going to be broken for you, my blood's going to be shed for you. You see, Jesus was all about tradition. Tradition wasn't the bad thing. It was when tw- tradition gets twisted into becoming more important than, than the reality or the truth. And so Jesus is starting to push back on some of those traditions. And he doesn't end there. Look at verse 14. He makes it even worse. It's, it's almost like there's this, you can feel the tension starting to build between Jesus and these religious leaders. So all of a sudden, you see this kind of picture of the scene. Jesus is calling out these religious leaders. People are now probably stepping back like, oh, it's on. There's going to be like, it's going to be Jesus and the religious leaders. Let's see who wins, you know, that type of thing. Jesus calls the people, verse 14, he called the people to him again and said, hear me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Verse 16, and and some of our translations don't have 16, it's just just because earlier uh, manuscripts have this verse missing and some of the newer manuscripts have it in there. It says, if he has ears, let him hear, which is a common thing for Jesus to say. It's kind of like his trademark phrase, like, if you have ears, you need to listen to what I'm saying. This is important. So Jesus calls these people closer, right? He calls them in a little bit. And he says, hey, some of the things that that you're reading here, or some of the things that you're hearing are going to be shocking. And, And everyone's kind of processing it a little differently. Some of the things that God had promised, commanded the Israelites were intended to keep them healthy like the idea of what comes in your body but what has happened is technology has changed or uh, the ability to make things clean uh, to be able to eat certain things have changed by this point and 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 what had happened is the the Jewish leaders had made it so so difficult to even eat food and if you ate the wrong thing or you or you ate it with dirty hands you were defiled and and jesus starts to shift it he says it's not about the things that come in us that defile us because there's a difference between your stomach and your heart your heart is something else your heart is is the is the part of you that is that is about emotion and about feeling and about um about these these other aspects of your your desires right so Jesus is starting to kind of talk, kind of differentiate between what comes into our stomachs and what comes out of our hearts. He's trying to get to the heart of the issue that we are full of sin. So he's calling them on true internal righteousness. They cannot achieve, they cannot achieve this type of righteousness that they're expecting without some type of divine intervention. This is where Jesus is going to head with this. So look at the next couple of verses. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. (laughs) This is such a shock for even the disciples. Like, this stuff just does not make sense. They have been so brainwashed into believing certain things about the Mishnah as opposed to God's law that it's it's confusing them. They, They think Jesus is just telling another parable. Verse 18. And when he said to the and he said to them, Then are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not into his heart, but his stomach, and then is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Now, now remember, Peter is the one sharing this with Mark. And if you remember some of the story of Peter, there's this moment after Jesus left earth, Peter and the rest of the apostles are planting churches. But there's, there's some tension. Jews did not get along with Gentiles very well. And Peter is having this moment where he is kind of using some Jewish traditions, Jewish laws, 
to keep him separate from the Gentiles. And there's this moment, if you remember in the book of Acts, where Jesus and, God, uh, and Peter have this, this moment where Peter falls asleep and has his dream. And Jesus lays out all this food in front of him and says, you can eat all of it. And it's this, it's this crazy moment when it's all about this unclean stuff. That comment right there, I think it clicked with Peter. Not only did he remember that dream, but he goes back to this moment years before when Jesus said all food is clean. It took that much time for Peter to get it, and, and he, he makes a statement there. But he also, what we see in here is that Jesus begins to distinguish between the gut and the heart. Not, not our physical heart, but the spiritual one. The heart refers to one's attitudes or affections or priorities, ambitions, desires. And he says what you eat uh, and how you clean your hands, okay, that, that might have some value, but that's not changing your heart. That's not changing what comes out of it. Look at verse 20. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, for from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. That is what defiles a person. The, the imagery here that Jesus has uh, when he says coming out of, it's, it's this idea of a swarm of wasps coming out of. This, this swarm of death and, and evil coming out of a person. When he says evil thoughts, he's talking about d- the, these, these things that, that when we determine to do something evil to somebody else, sexual immorality, anything outside of sex between a man and a woman is sexual immorality. Theft. This is where we get the word kleptomania, to take something else from somebody. Murder. The word here in in the Greek that that Jesus is using here, the idea is this idea of slaughtering someone. Coveting an appetite for what belongs to others. Wickedness, a heart that is wanting to inflict evil on others. Deceit, baiting to deceive people. Sensuality, this, this open defiance sexually. Envy, an, an, an evil eye that is looking at what other people have and wanting it and trying to take advantage of them. Slander, to talk, uh, this type of talk that is anti-God and, and anti-another person against somebody else. Pride, putting oneself more important than somebody else. All these words that Jesus is using have some deep-hearted meaning. And what he's saying is that all of these religious leaders, this is what's coming out of them. That's what he's inferring, that they are evil. You can tell that there's some tension building. This is not going to sit well with these religious leaders. He is calling them out that everything that they do on the outside is just fluff. They're covering up the naked evil behind them. So, that being said... Jesus is starting to to stir some stuff up. And here we see that Jesus starts to make a statement about what he came for. We've been talking about this on Wednesday nights, that, that we are capable of some pretty awful stuff. We have sin inside of us. And that sin is what Jesus came to change. So what can we learn from this? Let's kind of take a look at some things. If you have your notes, you can kind of fill in the blanks. Uh, and this, this will help us understand where, where Mark is coming from. First of all, our hearts, our hearts have a problem, and it's called sin. Maybe it's a little white lie to sexual immorality, to, to murder. We are capable of sin. And because of our sin, we are far more capable of evil that we would never expect people to see. We desperately try to cover it. You and I, in fact, I'll say it this way, you and I are far more capable of evil than what we believe it's that sin in our hearts that defile us before God that ruins our relationships with God and ultimately others look at this in Jeremiah 17 I have these verses listed there Jeremiah 17 9 God says this the heart is deceitful above all things desperately sick who can understand it and he goes on and says I the Lord am the one who judges the heart we can't even judge our own hearts Romans 3 10 says this Paul speaking None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, no one does good. We have this idea that people are good. They, they are inherently good. And, and I think, I think to a point, I think we all want to be good. 
The problem is sin keeps us from being good. Inside, we are not good. We're full of sin and evil. And the only good that comes out of us is only because of the grace of God. Later on in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To glory, the glory of God is us in relationship with Him. That is the glory of God. We all fall short of that. You see, the Pharisees thought they had, they had it all together. They had the scriptures. But they had a defective theology about morality and sin. They tried to treat the symptoms instead of the real issue of what was coming out of the heart. And that's what Jesus is calling that all, all of our hearts have a problem and it's called sin. But also what Jesus is trying to reveal is that our hearts, our hearts need help and that's change. They need to be changed. Our hearts need a radical change. You see, culture and education, more church, more traditions, more worship, more prayer, those are not going to be the cure for our hearts. Those are not going to bring the radical change to our hearts that were needed. If, if a doctor told you, if you go to a doctor and he said, you have a heart problem and you need to take this medication and you need to change your eating habits and you need to start exercising, he's given you a set prescription of how you can change that heart. But if you go home and you don't exercise and you ignore everything he said and you just take a few more vitamins, you're not going to change your heart. It's not going to fix it. Our hearts need something, and it's called change. And our heart's only hope is the gospel. The only way our hearts, our desires are going to change is through the gospel. We've been talking about this on Wednesday nights in our gospel class, that, that we have this way of processing things, that our actions come from our thoughts. We start thinking about something and we do it. And if, and if we want to change our actions, we need to change our thoughts. But there's a problem. Our thoughts are fueled by our desires, these, these feelings and emotions in our gut to do something. And so ultimately, if we want to change our actions, we need to change our thoughts. But the only way we can change our thoughts is if we change your desire, our desires. And the only way we can change our desires is through the gospel. That's the only thing that will change our desires. We can try as hard as we can. We might be able to change some of our habits. But ultimately, what's inside is not being changed. Only the gospel can change it. If we want to change our thoughts, we've got to let the gospel change our desires. In fact, we, I'd say it this way, we need an aggressive regeneration of our hearts. It can't be just something that we passively do, that we just walk through the motions of. We've got to be aggressive towards it. Ezekiel 36, 26 God makes this command. This is, this is such a cool thing that God says. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That God, God says he will change us. Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him. In order that we might too walk in newness of life. What God wants from us is a different life. He gives us the hope, and it's only through his gospel. He is the only one that can change us. Jesus' death on the cross may have paid the price that we couldn't pay, but his resurrection is the prescription. Our hearts need to be changed. Timothy Keller says it great. And if you've ever, if you follow, uh, if you do anything like on Twitter or anything like that, Timothy Keller is a great pastor, and he has some really good quotes, and this is one of his quotes. He says this, The gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We are far more evil than we want to believe, but we are far more loved than we could ever hope for. And it's all because of Jesus. Here's the big idea this morning. If I want you to grab one thing, if, if Mark was standing here and he wanted us to understand one thing out of this passage, it's this, is that Jesus came to change us from the inside out. He didn't come just to change us from the outside so that whatever everybody else saw seemed holy and right and good. He came to change us from the inside out. So what do we do with this? Well, think of it, think of it as baby steps. You ever seen the movie What About Bob? One of my favorite movies. There's a very beginning scene 
where the, the character, Bob, is afraid to go anywhere outside of his house. But he's read this book about baby steps, and so he says, baby steps to the door, baby steps to the door, and he opens the door, baby steps to the elevator, baby steps to the elevator, and he just takes these baby, he thinks of everything in baby steps. Think of it in this way. I'm going to give you three things that we can do that, that can help us change, but for each of us, we might be at a different place. For some of us, we may have no relationship with God at all. For some of us, we may have committed our lives to Christ, but there's still something going on inside of us. And for others of us, we might be at a really good spot with our relationship with God, and, and we just need to do something with what we know. Here's the three things that we need to do. First of all, think of it as baby steps into developing a better relationship with Jesus and letting the gospel change us from the inside out. First of all, believe in Jesus. Remember the scene last week that we were talking about where the disciples are in the boat and Jesus walks on the water and then he gets in the boat and, and all the storm stops and then they make the statement, truly you are the son of God. We all need to have one of those moments where we recognize who Jesus is. See, to believe in Jesus is not just to have this mental assent to who he is. Oh yes, there's Jesus and he's the son of God and I believe that and it's just mental. Believing in Jesus and believing in his existence are two completely different things. I believe that George Washington existed. But me believing that George Washington existed doesn't change me. Biblically, when we say we believe in Jesus, there is a change that happens. There's a change that begins to come inside of us. He begins to change us in our hearts. Remember, our hearts are the attitudes and affections and priorities and ambitions and desires. And so as we believe about who Jesus is and what he did for us, Jesus promises that there will be a change in our hearts. There will be a change in our desires. There'll be a change in our ambitions. There'll be a change in our priorities, our affections and our attitudes. There will be things that change inside of us. But the first step is believing in who Jesus is and that he can change you. Second, trust in his word. Here's the reality. Our feelings lie to us all the time. One minute we feel good, the next minute we feel bad. Sometimes it's because something else, somebody did something or said something. Sometimes it's just our own guilt. We need something that is true no matter what we're feeling. God's word is true. It, it, it doesn't have any regard to our feelings. It doesn't change with our feelings or emotions or our whims. It's, it's kind of, look at it this way. God's word balances our emotions and feelings with reality, with truth. And when we put our trust in his word, we need to believe it. If, the God, if God's word says something is wrong, we need to trust that it's wrong and not try to find a way around it or an excuse for it. If society says a certain act or a certain behavior is okay, but the Bible says it's not okay, we don't need to go with, with whatever society is telling us. We need to trust God's word that, that he is protecting us from something, the evil that is inside of us. You know, when we follow our gut, we get ourselves in trouble. But when we follow God's word, there's peace. Finally, third, fill yourself with the gospel. I've said this in our gospel class many times, and this is just kind of how I word the gospel. I think of four words, created, or it's created, separated, crucified, sanctified. We are created by God for God. And, and, and that creation, God creating us, that is that relationship that he has with us, that creator and created relationship, that is the glory of God. But we are separated from God because of our sin. We have all fallen short of that glory of God because of our sin. So Jesus was crucified for us. It says that God demonstrated his love for us, that he sent his son to die for us so that we could be sanctified, so that we could be changed and constantly changed, daily changed, into a right relationship with God. Peter, Paul says it this way, it's no, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You see, it comes to believing in Jesus trusting his word, and ultimately reminding ourselves of what he came to do for us. That we are so much more evil than we want to let, let it on. But God, he loves us more than we could ever imagine. So this morning as we close, 
just know God wants to change us. Jesus came to change us, to change you, to change me, to change our desires, to change our, our, our attitudes, our reactions. Our feelings are going to lie to us. They're going to pull us one way or the other. Sometimes we're going to feel really good and really close to God. In these other minute moments, we're going to feel separated from him. We're going to feel like he's ignoring us or he's not close to us. But the Bible tells us that he is always with us. He's, he's right outside the boat, right there in the middle of the storm of whatever we're going through. And sometimes the things that get in the way of us recognizing where God is or where Jesus is in our lives are the very things that we've built up on appearance. The things that we are think of traditionally or the things that we let people see are oftentimes the things that are keeping us from seeing Jesus work in us. So this morning, as we've kind of stripped away tradition, we've stripped away the things that get in the way of us worshiping God, I want to take a few moments this morning, and we want to just sing again. In response to who God is, that He is, he is everything that he, call, he claims to be, that He's a healer, that He's our Savior, He's our deliverer, all those things. But He's come to change us and that we all can be changed by him. So as we sing together this morning, if you want prayer, we're here for you. We want to pray with you. But, but even beyond that, when you walk away today, will you look for opportunities to continue to worship God? Will you look for opportunities to find ways to worship God in those moments when it's not traditional that you would worship him? Maybe it's driving in your car. Maybe it's in your room at night before you go to bed. Maybe it's first thing in the morning. Find a way to worship God in a non-traditional way this week. Let's sing together. Come out of sadness wherever you've been. Come broken hearted let rescue begin. Come find your mercy. Oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless, and all those who stray, come sit at the table, come taste the grace, there's rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken. Lift up your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are. Fall in his arms, come as you are. There's joy for the morning, oh sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. 
Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. We've got an announcement? Yeah, just kind of a prayer request. Um, So a friend of probably, you know, more than a few of you in here, Jill Williams is, uh, she's in a bad way. She's a high school teacher. She teaches like five things at the high school. She's a mother of four. Um, uh, They go to the Presbyterian Church, but we can forgive them for that. Um, But no, seriously, she's, uh, she's in a really bad way right now, and they're really not even sure what's wrong with her, but she hasn't been able to uh, keep food down for like five days. And she's in the hospital. They're thinking about sending her to Dallas. And, um, yeah, they they think that they know an operation that they can give her um, that that she needs. But she's not strong enough for that surgery, like, without getting some nourishment. And she can't hold any of that down, even tube fed or anything. And so uh, we're just a little little freaked out about that. So keep her and, and them, the Williams family, Stan and Jill, and their kids in your prayers. Thanks. God, let's pray. We just want to pray right now for Jill and her family. Um, uncertainty can be overwhelming. But God, we, we have seen, it, it appears that they have a relationship with you. And so in the middle of what they're going through, um, God, will you help them just sense your presence? Will you show up in their lives in, in a unique way, uh, whether it's healing or whether it's just in the nurses or doctors that they interact with? Will you help them see how much you love them? We pray that Jill will be healed quickly in your name. Amen. Hey, we hope you have a good morning. Glad you're here. Enjoy the cold weather. Yay! Have a good one. See ya.